And we're back for the second lecture of today, which is going to be given by Monika Edelsburger, who is going to tell us about realizing synthetic gauge fields with ultra cold atoms. Please, Monika. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, so after this great lecture by Anusha, now it's my um, my goal or plan to tell you a little bit about applications of um, these things for cold atoms. And um, actually some of the wave packet dynamics and semi-classical description you will see again. So I think that's actually very nice, a very nice connection to the previous uh, lecture. So before I start, um, since I think it's the the only cold atom talk, I wanted to briefly introduce a little bit about uh, how these systems work so that you get a better idea of um, what we have available in terms of tools and how, how these systems look like in general. And before I start, uh, let me just give you a very brief overview of the plan. Um, so essentially, I, I would like to introduce a little bit our platform and then introduce the technique of laser assisted tunneling which makes use of uh, Fluke theory, which you have heard about last week, but applied uh, specifically to our system, which then helps us to realize artificial magnetic fields and mimic quantum Hall system. So in the end, I would like to show you uh, how we can use uh, these synthetic gauge fields in order to measure churn numbers. All right, um, so let's uh, get started with the description of the platform. And uh, usually we don't uh, really talk about this, uh, but I, I find it nice to, to explain a little bit like what the, what the different steps are that are needed in order to actually uh, generate uh, the system that we have available in the lab. So this is a picture that is actually taken from our cesium lab during construction. So by now it's, uh, it's involved and it got a lot more complicated, but essentially uh, you see here Till, who is one of the first students uh, started um, uh, building this machine. So on the right here, you see this part that is wrapped in aluminum foil. Uh, that is the main uh, part of our vacuum system, our central uh, part of our experiment, where we put in a chunk of material, that's our atom source, and then we heat it up. So for cesium, it's around 90 degrees, but for ytterbium, it's, it's around 420 degrees, for instance. So we have this hot thermal gas of atoms, and then uh, we have this construction of the vacuum system and the atoms simply diffuse into the vacuum system that we have built. So there's a couple of gauges, valves and, and so on. And then one of the main things here is the steel tube. So this essentially kind of collimates the atomic beam. So the atoms fly along the steel tube and then there's a counter propagating laser beam, uh, which if it's near resonant, scatters a lot of um, photons uh, with the atoms and then the atomic beam gets slowed down. And then we have this first uh, cooling section. So unfortunately, something went wrong here. I'm sorry. So there's this first cooling section here in the back um, that you barely see. So there we shine in counter-propagating laser beams from all three directions in order to cool the atoms to micro Kelvin temperatures. So really, all this happens inside the vacuum chamber. And the only thing that we use in order to cool the atoms is near resonant laser beams. And then in order to actually build a quantum gas microscope, I will show you images uh, about that. We would like to have high resolution objectives. So what you barely see here, so I have um, here a larger la picture of the science cell is a second part of the vacuum chamber. So we actually take the atoms, we transport them from one section of the vacuum system to another section, which is here this glass cell. And there we produce degenerate quantum gases. So there we cool the atoms further down to lower temperatures on the order of nano Kelvin. And the reason why this cell is made of glass, so you see here all these 11 uh, side ports, is that we have very good access um, for shining in additional laser beams and generating potentials for our atoms. So this glass cell, just to give you an idea, is, is relatively small. It has actually a diameter of a few centimeters, it's like five centimeters or so. So it's a really tiny uh, glass cell which is the, the heart of our experiment. And there we have good vacuum conditions. We have like 10 to the minus 11 millibar, which in the end uh, determines the lifetime of our many body system. Okay, so after um, all these different stages, laser cooling stages, we are left uh, with this degenerate gas of atoms. And depending on the species that we choose, we can either work with bosonic or fermionic atoms. And just very naively in a nutshell, how you should think about these systems is that if you produce um, Bose-Einstein uh, condensates at very low temperatures, so below the critical temperature, they essentially occupy 
all the lowest energy state of your system. So if you have a harmonic trap, then all these atoms would occupy the lowest uh, Gaussian mode of your harmonic trap. And this could be between 10 to the four or 10 to the six atoms that occupy all the same wave function. Now, if you work with fermions, uh, we can gen generate degenerate Fermi gases. And in this case, if you work with uh, two different spin components, they would fill up all the energy levels below the Fermi energy. And this is schematically depicted over here. And um, for the experiment that I've just shown you on the first slide, for cesium atoms, this is actually bosonic atoms. So we generate a Bose-Einstein condensate that we then load into an optical lattice. And this is essentially the last cooling step in our final science chamber, the glass cell. And then the temperature that we reach here essentially sets the temperature, the final temperature that we can reach for our quantum simulation experiments. So from this point on, we try to be as adiabatic as possible. So we gently load the dispose Einstein condensate or the degenerate Fermi gas into an optical lattice. And the optical lattice is generated by interfering fadi tuned laser beams. So for all these pooling stages that I mentioned before, we actually go very close to an internal transition so that we can scatter many photons. We make use of the dissipative force uh, from the laser beams. Here we go very far off resonant, such that the atoms only see a conservative potential. And the AC stark shift that they experience will then uh, show up as a potential energy landscape for the atoms. And the typical depth of these optical lattice potentials or other dipole trap potentials is below a millikelvin. So we, we really have to be able to cool the atoms to low temperatures in order to trap them in these potentials to begin with. So here you see the simplest example. So we have two counterpropagating laser beams that uh, have the same frequency, same polarization. So they interfere and create a standing wave, which for the atoms looks or appears as this periodic potential where the distance between neighboring wells is lambda half, where lambda is the wavelength of the laser beam that we use. And if we manage to uh, create very cold samples and load them adiabatically into this lattice potential, they essentially occupy the lowest um, vibrational band of this periodic potential. And then we can actually describe the dynamics of these cold gases using Bose or Fermi Hubbard models, depending on the species. And in its simplest form, such a Hubbard model has two key parameters a hopping matrix element J between neighboring sites. So this really describes the tunneling amplitude for atoms to move around in the lattice. And there's an interaction term U, so the on-site interaction energy if more than one particle sits on one side in the lattice. So for bosons, we can have higher occupations, more than two. For fermions uh, with two internal uh, degrees of freedom, we would have only at most two fermions per site. And this actually has um, led to a number of very interesting quantum simulation experiments, specifically in the, content, in the context of condensed matter, model Hamiltonians. But you can also ask fundamental questions about the thermalization of isolated quantum systems, because remember this system is actually um, very isolated from the environment. It's generated in a, in a vacuum chamber and the atoms are only held by these laser beams. In, in this optical potential. So in the end, if you generate a pure initial state and you let it evolve according to a certain Hamiltonian that you can engineer in the lab, you can really ask the question like, how does this system thermalize? How does it behave after long evolution times? So this is something that we know very well. And um, basically the goal of my talk is to tell you how we can make these Hamiltonians a little bit more complex in, in the lab. And um, so let me uh, continue. Sorry, there was a mistake. And um, the key new feature, I would say, uh, that maybe distinguishes our quantum simulation experiment from, from other platforms like condensed matter type systems is that the distances and time scales are very different. So if you look at this periodic potential that we generate here, the distance is on the order of the wavelength of the laser beam that you use. So it's on the order of a micron. And um, the time scales are also very slow. It's rather on the order of millisecond as compared to uh, nanoseconds or picoseconds in other systems. So we can actually take snapshots of our atomic clouds, uh, density resolved, so site resolved. And we can also um, nicely uh, look at the coherent uh, evolution of our quantum systems. And here in the upper corner, you see a snapshot of cesium atoms that are trapped in such an optical lattice. 
And now I would like to briefly explain to you how we can actually generate these images where you see that uh, these individual blobs, they actually correspond to isolated cesium atoms in a uh, square optical lattice. So each one of these bright spots um, corresponds to about a few, like 5,000 photons that are scattered from a single cesium atom. And the extent of one of these blobs is basically given by the resolution of the imaging system that we have built. Okay, so this is a schematic that shows the lattice potential that we generate in this uh, final science glass cell, uh, which has these 11 side ports. So what you see here is now two counter-propagating uh, laser beams or retroreflected lattices, which generate, if we overlap them, a square optical lattice. And in our case, the distance between neighboring sites is uh, 380 nanometers. Now, in order to image the atoms after the quantum simulation experiment, what we do is we increase the potential, we make it very deep. And in our case uh, here for this uh, particular experiment, it was on the order of 130 micro Kelvin. Now, what sets the depth of this potential? What we have to ensure is that if we now scatter resonant photons from our atoms in order to be able to image them on a camera, we need to make sure that during the scattering process, um, when the atoms heat up, the temperature is still low enough compared to the potential so that they are not heated out of the trap. And we do that uh, by again, performing cooling and imaging at the same time. So the same process that allowed us to cool the atoms in the first place and be able to trap them in these potentials now is again used in order to cool them while we are imaging them. And for cesium atoms, the, the steady state temperature that we can reach is on the order of 40, less than 40 micro Kelvin. So the trap depth needs to be actually large compared to that so that we can scatter many, many photons from one single isolated atom and then collect these fluorescence photons with a high resolution high resolution microscope objective onto our camera. All right, and this is how it looks from the side. So you see two uh, schematic high resolution objectives. In our case, uh, the numerical aperture is 0 0.8. So essentially it defines the opening angle with which you can collect scattered photons from the atoms. The larger this angle um, that you achieve, the better the resolution of your imaging system. And uh, in plane, we have these horizontal lattices that generated a square optical lattice that I showed you before. And in order to isolate a single plane, we have a vertical lattice. So here, these blue dots illustrate that the atoms are trapped in one plane of this vertical optical lattice that we generate by interfering two laser beams from the side. And this is important because otherwise, if you have more than one of these planes populated with atoms, you will get some blurry image on the camera. And this we do actually um, with a shallow angle vertical lattice that has a spacing of eight micrometer roughly. These um, more shallow beams uh, that are shown also from the side, these are the laser cooling beams that we need for imaging. And then in the end, you get snapshots like this. So here you see um, a few isolated cesium atoms after collecting um, scattered photons for about one second. So each one of these uh, blobs is one cesium atom. And then you can take histograms in order uh, to evaluate like how is the fidelity for you to decide if a single lattice site is actually occupied with an atom or not. So these peaks in the histogram, they have been um, extracted by looking at many, many of these individual snapshots and taking boxes around each one of these individual bright spots. And then we can simply count the number of photons that we can collect. And um, one atom would show up here on this um, horizontal axis as like 4,000 photons roughly. And this other peak gives you the background noise uh, that we have present in our system as well. And if these two peaks are very well separated, you can distinguish with very high fidelity if there's an atom present on a certain lattice site or not. And so this is a very unique tool because now what you can do is in fact perform quantum simulation experiment in these optical lattices where after your quantum simulation experiment, you take a snapshot. So you freeze the density distribution. You take a snapshot of the density distribution and simply evaluate where the atoms are sitting. So if you have this many body wave function in your system, this essentially projects you onto one fog basis state. 
So you have different occupations that um, are in, in the superposition that builds your many body wave function and you project it onto one component and taking many, many averages, taking statistics, you can evaluate the mean uh, density on each lattice side, but you can also evaluate uh, density density correlation functions, for example. All right, and here um, basically what you see is an averaged image over many of these isolated signals from individual atoms. And this gives you the point spread function or the resolution of your imaging system. And you can see that in our case, um, we achieve something on the order of 830 nanometer. This is compared to the lattice constant, uh, which is 380 nanometer. So we are not quite at a single side resolution, but we have developed um, deconvolution algorithms and techniques that actually still allow us to access um, the, the single side density resolution in our system as well. Okay, so this is just in order to introduce to you um, essentially the setup or the um, platform that we are using. So we have these cold atoms that we can prepare in uh, different types of optical lattice potentials with which we can then perform simulations of the Hubbard model, for instance. And one of the unique observables that we have are these density snapshots. Okay, so, but why are we interested in uh, using periodic driving or fluke engineering? And one of the main um, motivations why uh, we have actually started to look into that is because you can use these techniques in order to engineer topological phases of matter. And this is also the example that I want to use in order to introduce um, the laser assisted tunneling techniques or periodic driving uh, technique that we have developed in our lab. So here's a variety of different examples for topological phases of matter. And um, I will be focusing on integer and fractional quantum Hall insulators, um, which is one way to motivate how the technique works. And if you think about integer and fractional quantum Hall insulators, of course, um, one key challenge uh, that you may, may find for realizing this in quantum simulators is that in condensed matter, they typically require the application of an external magnetic field. And since our atoms are charge neutral, that's of course very challenging. All right, so let me briefly remind you um, about the physics of the integer quantum Hall effect. So what you see here is actually a Hall bar geometry. So in condensed matter, you have a two-dimensional electron gas, you send a current through your sample, and then you can measure the transverse Hall voltage and the longitudinal Hall voltage. And in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field, we know from classical physics that the transverse Hall resistance Rxy um, increases linearly with the applied magnetic field. However, now if we decrease the temperature to very low values and we crank up the magnetic field, you find that there are quantized plateaus that develop in the integer quantum Hall effect. And these plateau values, they're extremely robust and they actually depend on the topology of the energy bands that are occupied with electrons. So in a nutshell, what you find is that these plateaus are determined by natural uh, quantities, H and E, so the Planck's constant and the, the charge of the electron. And this integer number I is the Chern number or the sum of the churn numbers of the bands that are occupied with electrons. So we have seen that in the previous talk, the churn number characterizes the topology of the band. And I will get back to that. So here new characterizes the churn number of an individual band. And for this electronic system, we simply have to sum up all the uh, churn numbers below the Fermi energy. And then this gives us the uh, response of the system. Now, um, having this in mind, of course, we need to be able to apply this magnetic flux. And specifically, we will use Fluke engineering in order to engineer such an effective magnetic flux for our cold atom system. All right, so let me briefly um, motivate this quantity of a topological invariant, which is the churn number for electron bands. And I'm sure you have seen um, this analogy in one form or the other. I just want to emphasize two key points um, on this slide. So when people say that we can um, basically compare the topology of energy bands with um, the topology of geometric objects, I think what is nice that um, it shows you that the topology of these geometric objects, which is defined by the number of holes in the surface, makes this connection between a local geometric quantity and a global topological invariant. 
So the genus or the number of holes in the, in the surface of a geometric object can be computed using the gauss bonnet theorem. So here you have this local curvature that describes the manifold or the surface of your object. And if you integrate it over the complete manifold or the complete surface, you can assign the genus to this object. So you have this local curvature. And um, now this uh, is easy to understand. You have this uh, integral over the complete manifold that allows you to assign an integer. But now if you start deforming the surface, the local properties of the surface, of course, it does not directly modify the value of the integral, so the number of holes in your surface. In order to modify this quantity, you have to do something a little bit more violent, which is like punching a hole through the sphere in order to change the topology um, of this object. And this um, gives you a sense of the topological robustness, also in the context of energy bands for electrons. Now, in our case, this local curvature is actually the Barry curvature that you have seen um, in the previous talk. So the Barry curvature omega also tells you something about the local geometric properties of the band. And the integral over the complete surface or the complete manifold corresponds in this case to the integral over the Brillouin zone. So the, the quasi-momentum space, which is the, the space that defines our energy eigenstates in a periodic potential. So we can assign these global integer quantities to an electron band which determines the topology, the global topology um, of the band. And defining uh, or changing the, the local properties of the band now does not change the global um, invariant of the band. Again, you have to do something a little bit more violent in order to change the topology. And in, in geometric objects, the equivalent of punching a hole uh, through the surface of the sphere would correspond to a gap closing point in the spectrum. So if we want to change the topology of the band, um, we need to have a, a gap closing point in the energy spectrum that will then allow us to change that. And I will get back to that um, tomorrow when we talk about anomalous fluke topological systems. Okay, so but let's now start um, using fluke engineering in order to realize artificial magnetic fields. Okay, so the, the basic idea for quantum simulation of certain model Hamiltonians is essentially to write down um, a toy model that you're trying to implement in the lab. So before being able to study a quantum Hall system, we need to know what type of Hamiltonian we are actually interested in. And now we can simply go ahead and think about an electronic system, electrons that we put on a periodic potential in the presence of an external magnetic field that are like the basic ingredients that you need in order to generate a quantum Hall system. Okay, so if we write down a lattice Hamiltonian for non-interacting system, we have these tunnel couplings between neighboring sides, Jij. And for now, we forget about interaction terms. We just look at the non-interacting model. Now, if we add an external magnetic field to that, what happens is that these um, tunnel couplings become complex. So there are phases associated with it, which are essentially discretized versions of the Aharonov-Bohm phase. So these phases are related to the line integral over the vector potential, where the magnetic field is the curl of the vector potential. So if you calculate the Aharonov-Bohm phase around a closed loop, essentially you sum up all these discrete phases that you pick up on the bonds. And this can be then interpreted as an effective magnetic flux piercing the unit cell. So this Hamiltonian with complex hopping matrix elements describes non-interacting electrons that move in this periodic potential in the presence of an external magnetic field. And if we want to simulate such a system with our neutral charge neutral atoms in the lab, what we have to do is engineer these complex hopping matrix elements. So what we want to have is these non-zero phases phi along the bonds. And moreover, if we compute this phase around a closed loop, the corresponding Aharonov-Bohm phase should be non-zero so that we actually have a non-zero magnetic flux piercing the unit cell. And here I've expressed the phase phi through one unit cell in terms of the magnetic flux divided by the magnetic flux quantum. Now in our case, of course, the charge uh, does not have any meaning. So what we do is actually directly engineer the phases and then uh, um, interpret them as magnetic fluxes. But what you can also see is that actually if we manage to engineer these phases, we actually also have the freedom to engineer arbitrarily large magnetic fields. 
because we will imprint these phases directly by hand. So they are naturally on the order of pi, which means that if we do that, uh, we can reach regimes where the magnetic flux piercing a unit cell is on the order of a magnetic flux quantum. And if you try to do something similar in condensed matter physics, this would actually mean that you need to apply extremely large magnetic fields on the order of a few thousand Tesla, which is of course very challenging in, in experiments. There are other ways to circumvent that. So there are super lattices that you can build, uh, which allow you to enter this high flux regime. But in general, it's not easy to do that. Okay, so the question is, how do we actually get uh, these complex phases? And this is where um, Floquet engineering comes in. Uh, you have uh, seen this very nice uh, lectures last week on the, the theory of Floquet engineering. So I'll just briefly um, go through the key ingredients uh, just to remind you about um, the, the tools that we need. So what we need to be able to do is actually engineer a time-dependent Hamiltonian where T denotes the period of the drive. And then we will describe the dynamics of our system at stroboscopic times, so integer multiples of the driving frequency, and then derive in a high frequency limit such a time independent Floquet Hamiltonian HF. So for now, I will only consider the high frequency driving limit and not yet this other interesting regime where the frequency of the drive may be on the order of the natural time scales um, of the system. Okay, so we will derive this uh, time independent Floquet Hamiltonian. And then the goal is to find a driving protocol that allows us to engineer a Floquet Hamiltonian with interesting topological properties. And in particular, we would like to have one that breaks time reversal symmetry, or in other words, has these complex phases that appear um, in the tunnel coupling. And then we will uh, have a situation where we have this quasi energy band structure. So here's an example where the Floquet Hamiltonian would have this simple cosine dispersion. And then in the extended zone scheme, we have these copies that are separated by H bar omega. All right, so let me explain um, in a double well schematic how we can use this technique in order to get complex tunnel couplings. So this is the simplest toy model that you can come up with. We have two lattice sites that are denoted as A and B, a hopping term between them, and an energy offset delta between neighboring sites. Now, in the situation where we choose this delta to be very large, initially there wouldn't be any dynamics. So if I put a particle on the A site, because of this large energy penalty, it wouldn't be able to hop over to the neighboring site. But now I can restore hopping if I add a periodic modulation. So what we can do is we can add an additional potential on this site A, for example. So we have this on-site potential here, V of T, that we vary periodically as a function of time according to this frequency omega. So we have a periodic modulation with frequency omega and a phase phi. And we can choose to apply this periodic modulation on resonance. So we can either choose it to have a one photon resonance uh, with the potential, so delta equal to h bar omega, or there can be higher order resonances. So we introduce this integer new. So there can be two photon resonances, for instance, where delta is equal to two h bar omega, which also would allow us to engineer um, resonant hopping again. So in the presence of this periodic drive, atoms can absorb energy from the periodic drive and resonantly hop over to the neighboring site. And now if we go through the Floquet formalism and derive the effective Floquet Hamiltonian in the high frequency limit, we will find uh, this restore tunneling Hamiltonian with new effective uh, tunnel coupling J, which is proportional to the original tunnel coupling J and the special function um, of order new where new indicates um, the order of this uh, resonant photon uh, tunneling, so this n-photon drive or new photon drive. And on top of that, we find this complex term, so the phase phi uh, that originates from the phase of the periodic driving. So the argument of the special function actually depends on the amplitude of the modulation and the modulation frequency. Okay, so this phase phi allows us um, to engineer complex hopping matrix elements. In essence, it's imprinted on uh, the tunnel coupling between neighboring sites. And we can actually measure that in the lab. So we can see that that actually works by making this uh, toy experiment and generating isolated double well Hamiltonians. 
So um, previously I showed you that we can generate this square optical lattice, but we can add an additional standing wave at twice the frequency. So we can generate this type of bichromatic optical lattices, where now you have these double well potentials along one axis, for instance, where now this uh, high barrier inhibits tunneling completely. So you can do uh, an experiment where in each one of these double wells, you put a single particle on the left side of this double well, and then simply watch tunnel oscillations between neighboring sites. And now we ask what happens if we add a periodic driving. So we can do that either in the symmetric case, but we can also explore this n photon processes um, that I explained on the previous slide. So we can look at uh, first order resonances or second order resonances, and then simply measure the renormalization of the effective tunnel coupling J effective that we get in the Fluquier Hamiltonian. And this is how these traces look like. So this is what we've taken in, in the lab. So essentially minus one here on the vertical axis means that the atom is localized on the left side of the double well, and plus one means uh, we find it on the right side. So now new equal to zero means we are driving a symmetric double well. So we see this tunnel oscillations between neighboring sites and we can extract the tunnel coupling just by fitting the frequency of this oscillation. And we can do that for different types of modulation parameters. We can vary the modulation amplitude and also change um, the resonant process um, that we engineer by applying a tilt between neighboring sites. So if we do that for various different uh, driving parameters, we find um, that indeed this renormalization of the hopping matrix element follows the Bessel behavior that we expect from Fluke theory. So what you see here with these red data points is the symmetrically driven double well, where because it's a zero order photon process, we expect uh, the effective tunnel coupling to vary according to the zeros order Bessel function. Now, uh, for the first order tunneling resonance, we have applied uh, tilt between neighboring sites and we resonantly restore tunneling with the periodic drive. So here you see the two uh, distinct features. For the symmetric double well, of course, if the driving amplitude, which is um, characterized here by this parameter psi, is equal to zero, we get normal uh, tunnel oscillations between neighboring sites. And if we increase the amplitude, it gets renormalized. And as a function of the amplitude, we can even achieve a situation where tunneling is completely suppressed. Now, if initially we have a tilt between neighboring sites that, su that suppresses tunneling, we actually need to apply this periodic driving in order to restore or initiate tunneling in the first place. So that's why for zero um, modulation amplitude, there's no tunneling whatsoever, and it uh, increases linearly with um, the driving amplitude for small values of the driving amplitude, and then it follows this uh, Bessel function um, of first order. And um, here, actually, what you see here is really just the theory, the Floquet theory overlaid with our data points. So there's no uh, fit parameter. It just works beautifully in this limit of high frequency driving. And uh, the effective tunnel coupling follows what we would expect from Floquet theory. Now, of course, this is just the Hamiltonian, the effective uh, renormalization of the tunnel coupling. But what we are actually interested in is the complex phase that we need in order to get topological bands. And in order to see that, of course, we need to do something a little bit uh, more non-trivial. We want to have a 2D lattice with complex phases that has an effective magnetic flux. And of course, this only makes sense in 2D. In 1D, we could always um, apply a gauge transformation and map it to a trivial double well with simple tunnel oscillation between neighboring sites. Okay, so let me explain to you how we can use um, the simple toy model of a driven double well in order to generate um, artificial magnetic fields in a 2D lattice. Okay, for that, what we need is first uh, an energy offset that inhibits tunneling, similar to the tilted double well. And here I will restrict the discussion to uh, the first order resonance. So we will actually apply this energy offset data between neighboring sites that is large compared to the hopping. And then we will apply a modulation frequency uh, that is resonant, so h bar omega is equal uh, to the energy offset delta. So this happens along one axis, here along the x-axis, and perpendicular to that, we will apply just a bare uh, lattice Hamiltonian, so just a normal lattice with hopping jy. Now, in order to restore tunneling between neighboring sites, we will apply two additional laser beams 
that are again far off resonant to any internal transition. So they will generate an optical potential according to the AC star shift. And we choose these beams such that they have slightly different frequencies. So omega one and omega two are different. In particular, the difference between them matches the energy difference between neighboring sites data. Okay, so now in order to understand what happens, we write down the local time dependent potential that is generated by the interference between these two beams. Okay, so if I go ahead and do that, I will find that apart from some constant terms, I have an amplitude V0 that, that is determined by the depth um, of the potential generated by the two beams. And I will have an interference term um, where omega is the difference frequency between the two beams. And there's a phase phi, which actually depends on the position in the lattice. And let me uh, show you in a schematic intuitively where this phase comes from. So uh, first, let me explain in words. So this interference between these two laser beams at different frequencies, omega 1 and omega 2, generates an interference that is diagonal with respect to the square lattice. And it will uh, generate a running wave across the lattice. So if I plot the potential or the phase front at one specific point in time, you see these gray points. So this, the gray line here, diagonal across the lattice, would, for instance, correspond to a wave front uh, with zero phase. And then the shading uh, illustrates how the phase advances across the lattice. So this um, neighboring uh, diagonal line that is, again, uh, gray, uh, would correspond to a phase equal to 2 pi. So if you follow um, along the y-axis, uh, the phase front of this interference uh, between the two beams, you would see that it advances for this specific example uh, by a factor of 2 pi every four lattice constants. You also see that here on, on the cuts along the x-axis and the y-axis, you see the intensity uh, profile and it's periodic um, uh, every four lattice constants where it advances by a factor of 2 pi. And this is just one snapshot. If you would uh, let it go as a function of time, you would see that it runs um, across uh, the, the lattice in a diagonal way. Okay, but in other words, this actually means that this periodic modulation that we apply, this cosine omega t plus phi, um, is very similar compared to the double well toy example that I gave you on, on the uh, previous slides. And this phase now depends on the position in the lattice. But that's great because in the end, of course, we want to have something where the spatial dependence um, gives rise to a non-zero phase if we go around a closed loop. And if you compute it, it's actually given by the projection of the wave vector difference between the two beams onto the laser-assisted tunneling direction. And um, what is shown here below is, is actually the equation, again, um, of the Ploqué Hamiltonian that we can derive in this driven system. And you will find that along the y-axis, even though there was actually no um, potential tilt that inhibits tunneling, um, it is also renormalized according to the zero order Bessel function of a driven uh, symmetric uh, situation. And along the x-axis, we get these complex phases. So the laser assisted tunneling in the presence of the tilt gives rise to complex phases along the x-axis. There's real tunneling along the y-axis. And then um, we have these phase terms on the red bonds. And if we compute the phase difference between the two, this is what determines the flux per unit cell. And what you also see is that um, this is actually fully tunable because it's given by the wave vector difference between the two red beams. So depending on the orientation, the geometry between the uh, beams and the underlying lattice, you can actually engineer any uh, type of flux that you would like to have in your lattice. So this phase uh, phi is fully tunable. Um, in this specific example, it's set to, to pi over two. And in the end, this allows you to engineer the famous Hofstadter model. So this is um, now written in the Landau gauge. So essentially what the Hofstadter model describes is a square lattice in the presence of a homogeneous magnetic flux. So you see here along the X and Y axis, we have tunnel coupling J between neighboring sites. Along the X axis, it's a complex hopping and the phase advances by N times phi. So N is the lattice index along Y and M is the lattice, lattice index along X. So for the example of phi equal to pi over two that I've given um, on the previous slides, you see that the space factor of the complex hopping increases linearly as a function of the y coordinate. And now if you were to compute the phase uh, around a closed loop, you find it's equal to pi or in general equal to um, the flux phi per unit cell.
Now, uh, this actually changes um, the band structure of the lattice. So if you now um, go ahead and calculate the band structure, you have to take into account that the unit cell is modified due to the presence of uh, the artificial magnetic flux. Now, if you first ignore uh, the artificial field, you have a normal square lattice with a cosine type dispersion along X and Y. If you add the vector potential or the magnetic field, then you can actually show that now the unit cell is increased and the new magnetic unit cell contains an integer multiple of a flux of two pi. So in this specific example of a flux of pi over two, it would be four times larger as compared to the original unit cell of the lattice. So this actually splits uh, your tight binding band into magnetic subbands. And this is what gives rise to this very famous single particle Hofstadter butterfly energy spectrum. So what you see here is actually the energy of the lowest tight binding band of the two-dimensional square lattice um, on the horizontal axis. For the uh, square lattice without flux, the bandwidth is given by J. And on the vertical axis, you see the flux that is applied per unit cell. So phi B in, in units of the magnetic flux quantum. And for our specific example of the flux of uh, the phase of pi over two, this would correspond uh, to this factor one over four. So 0 0.25 in this Hofstadter um, butterfly spectrum. So it's these four blue uh, lines that I've indicated here. So in the case of pi over two, the lowest tight binding band actually splits into four subbands because the magnetic unit cell is four times larger as compared to the original unit cell of the lattice. So we have the lowest, type by, uh, lowest magnetic subband over here, which is actually topologically equivalent uh, to a Landau level. It is characterized by a churn number equal to one. And now by tuning the geometry of these laser assisted tunneling beams, in principle, you can explore any value um, of the flux per unit cell that you would like to have. Okay, so how can we actually see in an experiment that we indeed have this artificial magnetic flux in our system? And here I would like to walk you through a little toy experiment that we have um, performed in the lab now about uh, 10 years ago. And um, the, the first thing that may come to your mind uh, that allows you to test if you can actually mimic magnetic fields with your charged neutral atoms in the lab is to see something like cyclotron orbits. So you know that charged particles in the presence of a magnetic field, they evolve on cyclotron orbits. So we can now try to see something similar in uh, a lattice realization. And for that, we can again um, generate tiny lattices. Now, um, instead of double wells, we will actually generate little plaquettes. So similar to what I've shown you before, that we can isolate the dynamics to only two sides in the lattice, we do that along two directions, and we isolate all the dynamics to a little uh, plaquette that consists of four lattice sides. So the hopping barrier between neighboring plaquettes is large enough that atoms cannot tunnel between neighboring plaquettes. And now the toy experiment works as follows. Again, you put a single atom into such a tiny plaquette, and you watch it evolve as a function of time. So initially, this gray blob shows you that the atom is delocalized over A and D sides. And then we suddenly let it tunnel over to the neighboring bond. And at the same time, we also turn on the magnetic field, magnetic field which is here indicated by this flux phi. Now, first, without the magnetic flux, the atom simply would undergo tunnel oscillations between the left bond and the right bond in the lattice. So if we watch the mean position as a function of time, this would correspond to a horizontal line in this plot. So what you see here is the mean position along X and the mean position along Y. So originally the atom is delocalized on the left bond. This would correspond to minus 0.5 along X and zero along Y. Our initial state was not perfect. So that's why the dot is, is somewhat over here, um, which is not um, exactly zero and uh, minus 0.5, but close to it. So now if we watch it evolve as a function of time, um, and there wouldn't be any magnetic flux. It would uh, correspond to oscillations along this horizontal line, just simply undergo Rabi oscillations between the left and right bond in the lattice. But now what we see if we turn on the magnetic flux is actually that this, the system starts to evolve towards the right bond, but then gets deflected and performs this discretized version 
of a, a cyclotron orbit on the plaquette. And from this, we can actually directly extract uh, this artificial flux that was engineered using the laser assisted tunneling technique um, that I've explained to you on the, on the previous slides. So from this experimental data, we actually um, found a value of 0 0.73 times the flux pi over two um, that I um, explained with the previous uh, laser beam configuration. Okay, so this is just to um, explain uh, the type of methods that we use in the lab. And now the question is actually, how can we access the topology of the system? So what can we actually do in order to see the topological bands of this uh, driven system? And um, I will actually today only talk about um, the high frequency driving limit where we treat the Floquet Hamiltonian essentially as a static system. So we use the idea of periodic driving and Floquet engineering to realize uh, this topological lattice model, which is the Hofstadter model. And then we apply um, the topological characterization we know from static systems. So we go ahead, we diagonalize the Floquet Hamiltonian, we compute the churn number, we compute the barrier curvature, and then we develop techniques that allow us to probe um, these topological properties of the Floquet bands in a stroboscopic way. And I think I have like five minutes left. Um, so uh, let me very briefly walk you through the idea. So on the previous, or in the beginning of the lecture, I've showed you that the churn number is defined as the integral over the Berry curvature, um, which actually tells you the local geometric properties of the band. So it's defined as a winding of the Bloch functions, which are our eigenstates, u, as a function of quasi-momentum, qx and qy, and then we integrate it over the full brain zone and divided by two pi, this gives us an integer, which is the churn number that characterizes the band. And there has been actually an impressive number of um, experimental techniques that have been developed over the years that allow us to directly access these geometric properties. And to give you an example, I would like to show you um, one uh, specific plot um, that I've taken from Christoph Weitenberg's team in, in Hamburg um, which just uh, flashes uh, some of the nice features of our collatum systems that actually allow you to map out the Berry curvature momentum space resolved. So what you see here is actually data that has been obtained in a fermionic experiment, hexagonal lattice. So this black line shows the first Brillouin zone of the hexagonal lattice, where the Berry curvature has been resolved as a function of QX and QY. So these red regions are positive Berry curvature, the blue regions correspond to negative Berry curvature. And from this plot, you could go ahead and um, calculate the churn number of this band by summing up all of these values of the Berry curvature. And this is nice because actually, as you modify the geometry of the band, you can these, take these type of um, measurements and see how the Berry curvature is locally changed as you change the properties of the band. And you can also directly connect it to the churn number, which characterizes the global uh, topology of the band. Now, I want to uh, briefly connect to um, the lecture from Anusha that you have heard uh, before, which um, explains how we have actually measured uh, the churn number in our lab. Or maybe I should take the question in between. Yeah, we can we can take a question if you if you want. Um... Sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. My question is that you said that you can measure the Berry curvature. Can you also measure a uh, quantum metric, meaning the real part of the quantum geometry tensor? Right. So there are actually recent experiments. I've not included that on the slide, so I actually don't have the references here. But there are recent um, experiments that have uh, characterized or measured the full uh, geometric tensor, the quantum metric of, of their system. I see. Thank you. Hi, Monica. It's yeah. me, Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> Clear, beautiful experiment and uh, amazing presentation, right? Look, at the, the beginning, you showed some condensed matter systems, uh, namely the vial fermions. And uh, you, in your slide, you mentioned about the fern arcs. In cold atoms and in your lab, are you measuring this analog of fern arcs? If so, could you? Uh, say some comments, how you are performing the experiments, please. That, yeah, 
So this is actually much more challenging. Um, so actually, as as you will see, I'm I'm even uh, just restricting everything to to single particle dynamics, like two dimensional lattice, topological lattice models, Hofstadter models, and um, uh, the Haldane model, uh, generating uh, these more complicated systems. There there are ideas out there, um, but uh, this is very very challenging. So I think that's a a whole discussion in itself on how one could first engineer these systems and then even see uh, these Fermi arcs in, in such a cold atom experiment. It's, it's not easy to do. I'm sorry that I cannot give more details uh, about this at that point. OK. Um, Monica, do you want to um, continue for, for a few more minutes and then take more questions? or Yes. Let me just very briefly, because I think it nicely uh, connects to the wave packet dynamics that you've seen previously. Um, so the basic idea was to find a measurement that is more closely related to condensed matter type uh, transport measurements, um, which I have explained previously. So we send a current through the sample, we measure transverse voltage, and we, um, we will see that there's actually an analog in our synthetic systems, uh, which you can understand based on the semi-classical wave packet description. Uh, that Anusha presented and in her uh, in her lecture. Okay, so how do we actually do that? Um, we first load the atoms into a topological band. So in this case, we choose um, this lowest band with John number equal to one um, that I've shown you previously. So it's a flux pi over two. We have these four magnetic subbands, and we load our atoms into one of these lowest bands of the Hofstadter model. And now, in order to extract the churn number, we apply a force. Uh, so we actually tilted the lattice, and the force changes now the quasi-momentum linearly as a function of time. And uh, in the language of the previous lecture, uh, this is in the low uh, frequency limit. So we adiabatically change the quasi-momentum as a function of time to explore um, the, the distribution in the lowest band. Now, the dynamics in the semi-classical description, where we assign like a mean uh, position and a mean quasi-momentum to a wave packet, there's a band velocity, which is given by the derivative of the dispersion, as you have seen in, in the previous lecture. But then there's also this transverse contribution, which is proportional to the barrier curvature of the band. And this gives rise to this transverse deflection of the cloud, um, uh, transverse to the force that we apply to our system. And now, if we actually take snapshots of our cloud, we can directly learn something about the geometric properties of the band. And in order to get the value of the churn number, we actually uh, go ahead and populate all these quasi-momentum states. So we generate a filled band. And um, for fermions, we can actually do that by setting the Fermi energy within a spectral gap. In our case, we have worked with bosonic atoms. So in order to fill all the quasi-momentum states, we choose to work at a temperature that is uh, larger than the bandwidth of this band that we are interested in studying. So in this case, if we actually manage to populate all the quasi-momentum states, um, the center of mass motion of the cloud is given by the integral over all the quasi-momentum states that are occupied. So if we go ahead and analyze the, the center of mass motion of our cloud, so looking at the in situ snapshots, then we compute the average of this anomalous velocity, which is proportional to the barrier curvature. But taking the integral of the barrier curvature, of all the quasi-momentum states directly gives us the churn number of the band. So what we expect is actually that if we take in situ snapshots of our cloud, the atoms will simply move sideways compared to the direction of the force that we apply. And they evolve linearly as a function of time. And the slope is determined by the churn number of the band. All the other quantities that we know in the lab, so A is the lattice constant, and F is the strength of the force that we apply to our system. So if we go ahead and do that, we get data like that. So here you see the differential shift, the center of mass shift of the atomic cloud as a function of time. We call it this block oscillation time because the atoms actually undergo block oscillations in the direction of the force. But in a sense, it's, it's just the evolution time t that appeared in the previous um, equation. And then from this slope, this linear evolution of time, you can directly fit the churn number of the band. And the snapshots that we um, take in the lab essentially look like the ones that are shown here on the right. In order to be less sensitive to systematics, we first uh, take a snapshot of the in situ displacement for one value of the flux. Then we turn the direction around 
the atoms will deflect be deflected in the opposite direction. We subtract the two positions, and this gives you this right uh, red and blue blobs, which is just a difference image between the two from which we evaluate the differential shift. So indeed, from this uh, very nice linear behavior, we, you can then extract the churn number of the band, which in our case uh, here uh, gave a value consistent with one. Um, there's some uh, caveat to that, so it works beautifully, uh, but I have neglected interactions so far. And this is also something that has been mentioned already um, a number of times. Um, in the case where we have uh, non-zero interactions between the atoms, there are additional dynamics. And specifically in this particular experiment, these additional dynamics lead to higher band populations as a function of time. So if you let this system evolve uh, for longer times, uh, more than these 50 milliseconds that I show here, you will see that there's significant repopulation between the bands and this deflection will actually cease and we reach an, an in so-called infinite temperature state where all the uh, Fluke bands, uh, these mini Hofstadter bands, the four bands that we have generated are uniformly populated. And because the churn number of all these bands together is equal to zero, the deflection, this whole deflection will cease. So if you uh, look at the plot for longer times, you actually see something like that. So this is the same measurement. Previously, I stopped at 50 millisecond. If you watch it evolve for longer times here, up to 200 milliseconds, you actually find that there's uh, no hole deflection anymore. And this is explained by the band population. So we can actually measure the band population. So this is shown here. The upper plot shows you the population of these four magnetic mini bands. And at the end, after these 200 milliseconds, they are all uniformly populated. Um, which explains why um, after long evolution times, there's no hole deflection anymore present in our system. But okay, to, to wrap up, um, this is to show you that um, in fact, we are able uh, using this Fluke engineering techniques to generate these topological lattice models. And we can actually mimic quantum hall systems with a very different type of system. We have bosonic atoms that are charge neutral and we simply use this periodic driving protocols or driving techniques in order to engineer these new Hamiltonians that give rise to interesting properties. And um, with this, I, I stop uh, for today. Thank you very much, Monica, for this uh, very clear lecture. That was fantastic. And uh, we have time for a few more questions from the audience. Right, you can type in the chat or just unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand and ask. Well, okay, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can ask one. Um, so um, in the, you showed this deviation from the perfect um, quantization so to speak when you when you when you change the population of the of the fluke or when you don't have a filled band and empty bands right so so in principle um how much control do you have in your in your experiment you mentioned temperature as a as a control knob to populate basically the lowest band right um which other means right. do you have to control the, the population yeah so um of course, it's always easier to heat up the cloud. So it's always um, easier to generate more bands. Um, the, the lowest temperature is always determined like by the initial temperature, like how cold we get uh, during the preparation of, of the sample. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, things that may be interesting to do, um, I, I didn't show that, but in the context of topological pumping, for instance, you could imagine that you you start with a very cold sample in the beginning, which would actually not lead to a contest response. And then you add controlled uh, heating to your system. And then you would have this actually heating induced quantization because as you heat up the system, you would find that there is a quantized response as mm -hmm. soon as you start populating the, the full band uh, of your system. So these are things that, that one could do. All right. Okay. Are there... Maybe I, so I was actually mostly absent. Um, <laughs> I had to be in a different meeting, but uh, I, can, I, I was looking at one of the initial slides that you had. Uh, so you can realize these uh, square lattices with uh, flux and you had pi flux and so on. Is, is that accurate? You can actually create pi fluxes. Um, yeah. So okay. in principle, 
Uh, this is just given by the geometry that we choose. So this this flux pi is tunable from zero to pi, essentially. Okay. So my related question is um, for the hoppings, uh, do you have the uh, facility uh, to create uh, modulations of these hoppings in space? So sort of like um, SSH. Um, so um, SSH for sure. So it really depends on the specific spatial dependence that you're interested in. So there's okay. some things that are uh, easy to do and some things that require more engineering. Right. But right. Um, SSH type systems um, are relatively easy and mm -hmm. uh, they have been done in a number of labs um, generating uh, really local control. Um, is, right, uh, right. Truly local control would be hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm. Sort of personally interested in sort of SSH global, but with maybe say half of the system, somewhat different from the other half, and and so on. Um, anyway, but but I can I can send you a message about that. Later. Yes. 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 Thank because you. it depends on uh, what what you mean by the one half is different. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, if there are no further questions at this point, let's uh, thank uh, Monica and also Anusha, our two speakers again for today's lectures and close the session. Thank you.